Yo, what's going on guys? It's Cynical and welcome back to another video. So today we're going to be taking a look at the Q&A portion of the Kingdom Hearts 20th Anniversary event, where Nomura answers fan questions that were asked over on social media sometime before the event. In total, there are 16 different questions and answers, and trust me, there's some really interesting and juicy responses here from Nomura himself that gives us a little bit more insight towards a few things. So without further ado, let's just dive straight into it. Massive shout out to Audrey over on Twitter for providing us with the English translations. Her Twitter will be in the description down below. The first question is, is the nobody symbol already there when a nobody is born, or does Organization 13 mark them? Do the humanoid nobody also have the marks? Nomura said, the nobody symbol is already there when a nobody is born, however humanoid nobodies do not have them. You can consider the human nobody to be akin to a pure-blooded, heartless of sorts. So yeah, referring to the symbol that we can see on literally every single nobody we come across in similar fashion to how a pure-blooded heartless does not represent the heartless symbol. So for example, the shadow and neo shadow heartless do not have the heartless symbol on them. Rather, those specific types of Heartless are known as Emblem, which were artificially created by Ansem. So very interesting to see that Nomura considers the humanoid nobodies, you know, the ones that make up Organization 13, to be akin to that of pure-blooded Heartless. These are essentially pure-blooded nobodies. We finally got a question about Demix. Who exactly is Demix? I get asked this often, and if I answer it here, then we probably won't add it into the story. Is that all right? I think I'll leave it for later then. There is a numerous amount of mystery surrounding Demix, for the main reason being that he doesn't have any backstory whatsoever. Uh, pretty much every single backstory of Organization 13 has been explained to us. We got little tidbits towards Luxord within Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind, seeing that he quite clearly comes from wherever Yozora comes from, likely Quadratum. So now this only leaves Demix, and there's been some wild theories surrounding Demix uh, in regards to possibly being the Master of Masters, but honestly speaking, I think this answer from Nomura kind of clears that up, possibly. I mean, I still think, yeah, there could be a chance, but I honestly hope not that he turns out to be the Master of Masters. I just don't want that to happen in all honesty. But with him kind of mentioning that if I answer it here, uh, it won't get added into the story, if Demix really was this significant figure of being the Master of Masters, I don't think we'd get a response quite like that. And also, I don't think it would make really too much sense. If Demix was Mom, uh, why would he be in Organization 13 alongside Lushu? Uh, to me, it just doesn't make too much sense. As explained in Kingdom Hearts 3 by Xemnas, it is explained that he has ties to ancient Keyblade history, so I feel like there might be a chance that we'll see more of Demex and get an explanation of him in Kingdom Hearts Missing Link. Next up, do you get new inspiration from Yutada Hikaru's songs? I think about the opening movie after she gives us her songs. In that sense, yes I do receive inspiration from her music. It's a necessary piece to our puzzle. So it's nice to know that the direction towards how the opening movie for a Kingdom Hearts game will pan out uh, kind of starts to happen once Yutada Hikaru has created the piece of music that will go along with it. From there, Nomura can direct exactly how the visuals will pan out so they go along in junction with the song in the background. If we look at Yutada Hikaru's opening themes for Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, and 3, I feel like there is quite a lot of symbolism within the lyrics that directly relate to those games. Keeping in mind that these songs that are featured in Kingdom Hearts by Yutada Hikaru aren't written for the purpose of Kingdom Hearts. These are still her own songs with their own personal meanings to them. In Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, the players end up in Xehanort's heart, so does that mean that they're still there? You will find your answer if you play Dark Road and get the ending. You're going to play right into my hand. Proceeds to then laugh. Yeah, it always gets me a bit nervous when we see the uh, bracket laughs. Um, what are you planning, Mr. Nomura? So we'll get our answer in the Dark Road finale coming this August. It will be interesting to see if Xehanort acknowledges that he does have someone that is residing within his heart from those ancient times, and how exactly this affects his path to becoming the Dark Seeker. Was it through finding out that he has ties to the ancient Keyblade era that changed his path? In Kingdom Hearts 2, Riku handed a Keyblade to Kairi, but where did he get that Keyblade? Do you plan to write some backstory about that? 
If I say yes, then if I don't follow up, it'll probably be brushed aside. So yes, we do intend to follow up with this. Thank you. Honestly, thank you. This is one of those unresolved plot points that has still to this day confused everyone. Whereabouts did Riku get this Keyblade? Uh, Kairi was on her way to try saving Sora in the world that never was in KH2. She was being swarmed by Shadow Heartless. Out of nowhere, Ansem Riku turns up and just pulls a Keyblade out of his ass and hands it to Kairi. Here you go, here is your Keyblade. It, it's so strange, it's so sudden, it's so abrupt, and this has never been explained as to how exactly Riku got his hands on Destiny's Embrace. So for Kingdom Hearts 4, we know that Kairi right now is training to become a Keyblade Master. Uh, let's hope that that gets answered there. It's very strange and I feel like it's important for Kairi's character development as a Keyblade wielder. In the fight with Yuzora, depending on if you win or lose, there are two outcomes to the story. This seems to be a first in the series, and is there some meaning to it? Rather than having the two endings add meaning to the story, it was more like since Yuzora is insanely strong, most people would probably not be able to win against him. As such, we wanted to be nice to the players and let them see something after losing. We felt bad for players who tried their best to beat him but failed, and we thought it was sad if they weren't able to watch some kind of cutscene after losing. Nomura literally felt so bad that everyone would likely die the first time they versed Yuzora, and for the first other 100 times they versed Yuzora, that he's like, okay, to compensate, I'm gonna give you a cutscene. I'm gonna give you a little bit of eye candy. Here you go. So yeah, this is definitely a first in the series to have two different endings at the end of a game. We've never seen this before, and it sort of blew our minds a little bit because we were thinking like, all right, well, there's clearly a reason as to why there are endings here, and there's been the whole theory towards two timelines, uh, maybe two different outcomes will eventually link up and mean something later on down the track. Now I guess Nomura is just straight up confirming that uh, the good ending for when you defeat Yuzora is the canon ending. We've known about this for a little while due to in the files of Kingdom Hearts 3, that good ending cutscene is known as true ending. I mean, I still don't know, man. I, I feel personally that there is something more to it than just, oh, here's a cutscene because we added it because we wanted to add it, but no, it doesn't mean anything to the story because there's a lot going on in that cutscene when you lose. Sora gets crystallized, something we have never seen before in Kingdom Hearts. This is very similar, if not the exact same, to Crystal Stasis, which is something that appears in Final Fantasy XIII and within the Fabula Nova Crystallis. Uh, mythology of Final Fantasy that Tetsuya Nomura was working on way back when. Yuzora then ends up in the final world, the daytime version. So I don't know man, I honestly don't trust what Nomura is saying right here. And I do believe there is more than meets the eye when it comes to this multi-ending thing in the secret episode. At the end of Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, did Ephemer notice the player's real motives? For those who played the game, they should know what kind of parting they had with Ephemer, albeit a sad one. As for Ephemer himself, there's quite a lot in store for him. I'd suggest playing Missing Link as it delves in the backstory of the past and will surely have the answers to the mysteries. So this is referring to the ending portion of Union Cross where the player ends up uh, pretending that they are in fact a possessed darkness to lead the other darknesses into a tube that connects into the uh, world of Wreck-It Ralph so that the player can then trap those darknesses for eternity. Yeah, the player literally memes these all-powerful original ancient beings known as the 13 original darknesses, a few of them at least, into thinking that the player was in fact a possessed darkness. This doesn't really explain if Ephemer was aware that the player wasn't possessed during the time. I don't think he did because, of course, we end up fighting Ephemer as well as Skald. Of course though, that could just be part of the whole plan of convincing the darknesses that uh, the player is indeed a possessed darkness. But more towards Ephemer will get explained within Missing Link. Of course, this takes us to the point where Brain has traveled into the future, into Scala and Kylum, more of an ancient Scala though, compared to the one in Kingdom Hearts 3. This revealed to us that Ephemer was the one that built Scala and Kylum, so more to do with Ephemer is going to happen in in Missing Link. Due to the fact that there is a massive statue in Ephemer's honor in the uh, sort of fountain area of Scala and Kylum, I would say at this point 
uh, Ephemera has probably passed, but more to do with him will surely ensue. When did Namine and Anson the Wise meet each other? They met when Namine was alone after Organization 13, Sora and Riku left Castle Oblivion. As for the exact timing, you can probably guess when, but we do not have any story written about that. Yeah, there is no cutscene or anything that shows us both Namine and Diz meeting each other. Uh, we know, of course, they end up working together uh, in Kingdom Hearts days as well as Kingdom Hearts 2 to restore the memories of Sora. Namine's mission is to restore Sora, and Diz's mission is to seek revenge on Organization 13. So both of them kind of help one another out in order to restoring Sora, which would complete Namine's task, and bringing Sora back would ultimately lead to Organization 13's destruction. We don't see any cutscene of their meeting for the first time, but we can pretty much just assume that they joined up together at Castle Oblivion made their way to Twilight Town and set up the laboratory in the mansion basement. Now, this one is extremely fascinating. Why did Riku get a haircut in Dream Drop Distance? Now, it's it's more than just Riku's haircut, hear me out. In Kingdom Hearts 2, a lot of players said, cut Riku's hair, so I listened and gave him a haircut. If you ask me who exactly cut his hair, I'd say it was uh, from the wishes of the players. Look, honestly, I was completely unaware that this was a wanted thing for some of the community to know who exactly whipped out the scissors to snip this boy's hair. That's hilarious to me. Continuing, when listening to players' opinions, although there are some where we cannot stray from, there were other voices that also made me uncertain about the path to choose. For example, I was very hesitant to bring back Roxas and Shion. I actually thought of a story route where they did not come back, but since I knew fans wanted to see their return, we ended up going with that route instead. That to me is absolutely wild. Like, wild. The fact that we have Shion and Roxas in current day Kingdom Hearts is due to the fan demand of bringing back these characters, which I think is just insane to think about, and that Nomura actually had a uh, written scenario of Kingdom Hearts 3 without the inclusion of these characters. Roxas' story totally could have concluded at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2, as could have Shion's in days. I think that Shion likely still would have been uh, one of the replicas being used to fill in one of the slots for the real Organization 13 uh, during the end events of Kingdom Hearts 3, but in the sense of her actually returning back uh, as her own person at the end of the game wouldn't have happened. But to imagine that ending of Kingdom Hearts 3 where we don't get that really cool uh, reunion scene of Axel, Shion, and Roxas with all the stuff towards Xemnas and the shade that he's throwing towards those three is a really insane concept to think about. Roxas is not my favorite character in Kingdom Hearts, but certainly is high up there. So I am absolutely thrilled we're living in this timeline where we ended up receiving Roxas and not the other dark, dull timeline where he just simply didn't come back. Now, as for the people that were wanting Riku to get a haircut, uh, I'm, I'm blaming you now. That's, that's your fault. Yeah, I've never been on board with the whole Riku haircut thing at all. I have always said that Kingdom Hearts 2 Riku is peak Riku. Look at the design of this Riku from KH2. This is just miles cooler than what we have here in Kingdom Hearts 3. I'm so sorry, Kingdom Hearts 3 Riku your slightly younger self has a little bit more drip drip going on. Is the reference mark from the world where the Master of Masters disappears in supposed to be a censored word? Yes, it's a censored word. It's written down properly in the script, you will understand in time, but at the moment it's still hidden. However, avid theory crafters might have an idea already. So we have known this for a little while, but that symbol is a Japanese reference mark or asterisk, and is being used to censor out whatever comes after a world of. Now we're assuming that the Master of Masters is referring to Quadratum. Uh, he is literally speaking of Quadratum in the situation when talking to one of the darknesses. But a world of, a world of what? He's already spoken about how this is a world of fiction, it is unreality uh, within this situation, so there is clearly more to this unreality or quadratum than we're allowed to know of as of right now. In Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, when Ephemer and Skald were alone and escaped from the data world, why did a bunch of noise flow through the sky? Since you already had escaped from the data world, there's not much weird plans that impacted the story regarding that. 
since we showed that the data world and the real world were heading to ruin, it was just an effect of that. This is referring to that weird sort of staticky noise fracturing effect that is going on in the scene when Daybreak Town is basically being destroyed. It's simply just an effect to portray the whole destruction of the world itself. Did someone give Isa the scar on his face? Why does it seem like a mark of a heretic? There is a story regarding Lee, Isa, and the girl they tried to save. Since there is a backstory there, we are thinking of expanding on it. We hope you can look forward to it. Yeah, we certainly got more of a backstory towards Lee and Isa within the secret reports for Kingdom Hearts 3, explaining that Lee and Isa would sneak into the castle of Radiant Garden to visit a girl who was being held captive in a prison cell during the time for experimentation by Anson the Wise, but not so much Anson the Wise, Apprentice Xehanort. We are theorizing here that this girl that is referred to that they would go and visit is likely to be sculled. The young Isa that we see in Birth by Sleep didn't have this X scar across his face, and we also see that it's something that remains on him once he goes back to his human version at the end of Kingdom Hearts 3 meaning that this isn't a symbol of him being a nobody. Similar to how Axel had the triangle tattoos under his eye, he ends up losing those when going back to his human form because that was one part of his nobody identification. So yeah, we've got no idea how he got that X scar across his face, and this will be something that will be followed up on in the future of the games. Also towards the backstory of them visiting this mystery girl will be touched upon too, so definitely looking forward to that. During the Keyblade War, or Master Xehanort could see what lies before him and took over Terra's body in preparation. However, young Xehanort should also have that power too. Why was he not able to use that power when he was younger? He just didn't have the power, or rather, he didn't have enough power yet. In regards to Xehanort, I highly recommend playing Dark Road to see what happens to him. The secret of his hairstyle will also be revealed. This cracks me up. We're finally going to understand why Xehanort is bold. Uh, we know that throughout his youth era, he had a luscious set of hair, man. So what ended up happening there? Why did he go bold? We're going to get these answers in the finale of Dark Road. Don't miss out on this one, folks. Personally, I thought it was just due to old age, but it seems like there's something more to it. What's the difference between Riku and Aqua falling into the darkness versus when others become heartless? Uh, there is a difference between falling into the darkness versus losing your heart. Even if your heart falls into darkness, you still are able to retain your heart. However, if you become a heartless, you lose your heart and that's the difference. There was a tiny bit of confusion going on uh, around this time of Anti-Aqua for Kingdom Hearts 3 and seeing that first trailer of Anti-Aqua during 2018, obviously there were a lot of theories revolving around it. Was she a Xehanort vessel? Is this some type of heartless version of her? But I do think that Kingdom Hearts 3 does an okay job of explaining this, especially if you did play 0.2. Because she had spent just so much time in the Realm of Darkness, uh, her heart ended up falling into darkness, but it wasn't to say that she was a heartless or nor a Xehanort vessel at that point. Her heart was just simply consumed, but her heart still remained. It is nice to get some clarification from Nomura on this one. It seems that Maleficent had glimpsed what was inside the black box and thought the reason would be shown in Union Cross, but do you plan to finally reveal this plot point? In the scene with the darkness and Maleficent, instead of making it very clear what was happening, the portrayal was more along the lines of, oh, is it this? It might be hard to tell for the player, but I think next time we might have uh, her explain why she reacted that way. Yeah, uh, this is something that has been lingering and lingering and lingering. We do know, of course, through Kingdom Hearts 3, and even within the extra scene that we got in the 2.5 version of the recoded movie, that Maleficent has a lot of knowledge on the Tome of Prophecies as well as the Black Box. That was her whole goal in KH3 was going to the different worlds to try find the Black Box. She knows what's in that Black Box, we still don't. We have no idea what that thing is. Uh, part of me thinks that like the Tome of Prophecies is held in that box. This is something else that she is also trying to track down, so hence trying to track down the black box, would that then lead her onto the Tome of Prophecies, or is the Tome of Prophecies just contained in the box along with something else? Either way, she wants the Tome, she wants the box, she likes this idea of the Tome being able to conjure worlds and to foresee future events, but that's pretty much all we know of, so 
so far. So obviously the black box will have a greater importance come this next arc. And to the final question, in Kingdom Hearts 3, when Xemnas crushes Lee's Keyblade, he said that the Keyblade was lost, yet Lee was still able to use a Keyblade after that. We had a lot of these kind of running gangs. It's not like it was lost forever, but that the Keyblade was just destroyed at that specific location. The meaning we wanted to convey was that even if Axel tried to bring back his Keyblade, it would just get destroyed again in that moment, with the nuance being it's futile for him to use it at that time. Xemnas doesn't have the power to actually permanently destroy Keyblades. Certainly one of the most memorable scenes from Kingdom Hearts 3 was obviously when Xehanort grabs Lee's Keyblade mid-swing and snaps it, destroys it, eviscerates it. There was a lot of confusion here because yeah, shortly after this scene, we then see Lee holding his Keyblade once again and I guess a lot of us thought like, wait a minute, what? What just happened? Like, I, I thought Xemnas just destroyed it. But uh, this kind of clears that up, I guess. Uh, yeah, Xemnas doesn't have the power to just outright destroy Keyblades. Just within that moment itself, he was able to remove the Keyblade from Lee. So that right there is the Kingdom Hearts 20th Anniversary Q&A. All of the juicy goodness from Tetsuya Nomura. My absolute favorite one is knowing that uh, Nomura sometimes does listen to the fans and kind of offers up some fan service. How much of this has happened throughout the series, I've got absolutely no idea, but I think it is wild to know that Roxas and Shion, uh, in a different timeline somewhere else in an alternate reality, may never have uh, returned for Kingdom Hearts 3, and that somewhere out there in the Square Enix offices, a version of Kingdom Hearts 3 exists without them. Alright guys, that's all for today, hopefully you're having a damn good one, I'm Cynical, and I'll catch you guys real soon. Peace.